years. I haven't had to drink or use. I'm also alumni from Lost Recovery. About nine years ago, I was a client there, now I'm the nurse manager there. My name is Chris Gates. I am the recovery and alumni manager out at um, our inpatient treatment facility. What that means is I teach the 12 steps and I run our alumni community when, when everybody gets out. Um, I'm also in long-term recovery, 20 years from a near-death heroin addiction. And uh, so I'm working with people trying to help them find the same path that I've been on. Um, so just show of hands, how many people in this room have some first-hand experience either personally or with a loved one or a friend who has struggled with substance use problems? Drugs, alcohol. It's a lot of you. So we're, we're talking to people with some some lived experience. That's awesome. Um, you know, it's a, sometimes you walk into a room and, and it's just blank stairs. You know, it's, it's like trying to explain math to a dog. But if, you, but if you've got some lived experience, that's awesome. So we're just going to walk through a little bit of, of uh, what this really looks like. So this is just sort of an overview of where we're going today. Um, we're going to start with just sort of like getting on the same page in terms of terms when we're talking about substance use, what we're really talking about, and also kind of myths and facts. There's a lot of misinformation out there, a lot of stereotypes in the media, so we're just going to kind of like sweep those aside, and then we're going to talk about um, kind of like evidence-based practices, so what the research says in terms of best practices for substance use treatment in sort of those three areas. And then we're going to talk about like what that actually means for people, right? So like how to apply the research to what y'all are already doing. Um, and then at the end, like the services that are available through Austin Recovery. So what happens on site when you refer a patient, but also, you know, if they need more support than just seeing me once a week, there's sort of multiple levels of care that they can get connected to that I help them connect to um, just through this partnership. Um, but I think the, the main takeaway that we want you all to have if you, if you remember nothing else is, or if you take nothing else away from this is, you know, we're going to give you a framework for kind of where the field is in terms of substance use treatment, but what we want is for, to kind of highlight the unique areas that already exist in your workflow. We know y'all are busy, we know you have a lot of screenings and things that you already do as being an FQHC, so there are points in your workflow where you come in contact with patients where you already are like uniquely situated to have an important intervention about <coughs> substance use, and so we want to clarify what your role is. So it doesn't mean that it's your job to have the perfect conversation that's going to make someone stop using drugs or alcohol, right? That's that's not the place where you can be the most impactful. And so we, but there is a way to, to kind of plant a seed and open a door, and so we want to sort of highlight the place where you are uniquely, many of you are uniquely situated to have that impact, so you kind of kind of know within your scope and feel like you're set up for success to do that. This is my reminder to take a breath, so taking a breath. Um, okay, so myths and facts about substance use. So again, there's a lot of a lot of misinformation out there, um, and even um, a lot of different terminology. So even so stereotypes in the media, but also even kind of clinically, lots of different um, terms are thrown around, and then even diagnostically, for those of you that use the DSM, like from the DSM-4 to the DSM-5, um, they change the diagnostic terminology. And so not, we know that not everyone here is like assigning a diagnosis to patients, that's not necessarily your role, so we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of like who qualifies for, you know, mild versus severe substance use, and also the nice thing about the DSM is that it's just all right there, so they just meet the criteria. Then that part of it is pretty clear. The rest of it is not quite as straightforward. So the framework that we want to provide is this idea that um, kind of differentiating between risky substance use and um, when we think about addiction, um, well, kind of the chronic disease of addiction. Um, and we're kind of differentiating that because we're going to go on to talk about the chronic disease component of substance use, but not everyone who's struggling with drugs and alcohol necessarily has the chronic disease at the moment. That's one of the challenges that, that the medical community and the, and the recovery treatment community face is that we don't have a solid diagnostic tool for determining who is an addict and who's just got severe substance use disorder. You know, uh, when I was using, you know, I was in a band full of guys and I was not the worst guy in the band. But as time went on, three of those guys just got older and knocked it off. And, and, uh, and two of us didn't. And, and if you look back in 1990, the two that didn't were not the ones you would have pointed at as addicts. You know, so it's real, we don't have a good diagnostic tool yet. And so it's, it's being able to, to get in there and, 
and, and figure out. And over the next 10 or 15 years, working with folks like you guys, we're going to begin to develop those a, a real serious set of diagnostic tools. You know, abstinence is not what every single person needs, but but for a lot of us, it's the only solution. And, and you know, with your help, we're going to help develop those sorts of diagnostic tools. Which I, I think is what makes it kind of difficult if, if you're having to be one of us is that we're always chasing this idea that maybe we're not the one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right, and that's and that's also where some of the um, I think some of the frustration and the stereotypes come in because it's like how come some people do get to like pick up and put down, you know, or like have a couple drinks and it doesn't eventually ruin their life, right? And so I think the takeaway is that you can't always tell, right? You can't tell by looking at someone, and you might not necessarily know in the moment, right? Because it's a it's a complex set of factors, and we'll talk more about that, like what makes people more vulnerable in terms of like genetic components, but also environmental stressors that might make someone more vulnerable to having a relationship with substances that negatively impacts your life, right? So we do, what we want to do is just sort of differentiate when we go on to talk about the chronic disease of addiction. We're not saying that every person who is using a little bit more than um, well, so than they need to falls into that category. So we just want to like give that framework for you. So um, the National Center on Addiction and Substance Use kind of differentiates these two things with risky substance use being the use of substances in a way that impacts your health and potentially your safety, um, and you're kind of using substances outside of what the national guidelines might be, but you haven't yet fallen into, you wouldn't necessarily meet a diagnostic criteria for like severe substance use disorder, versus addiction, so when we kind of throw that term around, one way of thinking about that is addiction as a complex and often chronic illness that has a lot of behavioral characteristics, um, it involves obviously the chronic misuse of drugs or alcohol, um, and these are the folks, for those of you who use the DSM, who kind of fall into the like moderate and severe side of things. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind as we go on to talk more about the chronic disease and addiction. That's kind of we're making that differentiation. Okay. And so, wait. So, what are some of society's kind of common stereotypes about addiction? This is the part where we make sure that you're all. <laughs> What have y'all what have y'all heard or what is the how does the media often portray people who might be struggling with substance use? They're weak. Yeah. Weak. Yeah. They're shaking a lot. So you can kind of visibly see that they're struggling. Anything else? They're all living on the streets. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone who's struggling with substances is eventually gonna become homeless or already is. What else? From a certain socioeconomic backgrounds. Yes, only certain people have a problem. Yeah. Anything else? Then their their appearance change, like they get like older, they seem older. Yeah, <laughs> it takes a toll on your body. Yeah. Um, and so and so some people it can feel really obvious, and then some people you might never know, right? Yeah. Anything else? Anything that y'all experience? <clears throat> In terms of like stereotypes? Well, I kind of was the stereotype for a long time. But uh, I mean, one, of the, one of the challenges for me, like when I was trying to get sober, was you know, I was a pretty low bottom guy. I mean, I'm, I'm a nice boy from a good family, and I ended up completely insane. And, uh, and so I had a hard time seeing the similarities sometimes. And I was introduced to a woman whose bottom was six glasses of wine a day. And I thought, we're not like each other. You know, she needs a hobby. She's not like me. <laughs> but then she started talking about her, the world she lived in and the relationship to that wine. And the world she lived in, she was a stay-at-home mom. Her husband was a doctor. And, but she started drinking at 8 in the morning as soon as the kids left for school. And she didn't stop all day. You know, she was like a glass of wine every 90 minutes all day long because that, that would, that's what she needed to function. And her relationship with that wine and my relationship with hair was the same. You know, our drug of choice was largely driven by culture that we, that each of us lived in and not by the severity of our addictions. You know, it's my opinion that had she not sobered up when she did, she would have ended up being a single mom within the next year or so because her husband wasn't having it. Uh, and a single 32-year-old mom in Austin doesn't just drink wine for long, you know, and she would have found her way into other cultures. But, but on the surface, we couldn't have been more different. And I think 
I think a lot of the, a lot of what we hear also is sort of this idea around the whether it's a choice or not, and kind of what that and whether or not it's what that means about you as a person, right? Is that something that you're struggling with? So you hear a lot of like, oh, you just don't want it badly enough, or like, oh, you just haven't hit rock bottom, right? Like, it hasn't gotten bad enough for you yet to like wake up and decide to do something differently, um, or that, or even that acknowledging the chronic disease component that to do that is sort of like and taking responsibility away, right? Like, if we acknowledge if it's a chronic disease, then we're saying, oh, well, then you don't have to do anything, right? It's like the onus is kind of not on you. Um, and one of the reasons that we're talking about this is because like, what the research shows is that even in professional fields, some of this thinking still persists. So again, the National Center on Addiction and Substance Use survey, a survey of physicians showed that 43% of them still saw addiction to alcohol to be a moral weakness, to be a, like a moral failing. Now, only 9% of them saw that as, as solely a moral weakness, but still, it's, it's, it's still out there in many professional fields. And so, we don't necessarily feel like, think that that's the common denominator here, because one of the things we love about people is your commitment to being <coughs> centered and to being kind of that res mutual respect that you have for your patients. So, we're not necessarily saying this is you, but we know that it's out there, and so it's important to talk about. So it's also important, I think, as healthcare professionals, we learn this a lot, is that we have to look internally and within ourselves to see where our own feelings are about this and to see what our bias are towards these things and how is this going to impact the care that we provide the patients. Is it something that we can learn to, to, to work past or is it something that we can actually, through something like this, maybe learn something new? Um, so it's actually important that we see how we actually feel personally about our it would be real interesting to take the poll of, of physicians and see how many of them see type 2 diabetes mm -hmm. as a moral failing. Mm -hmm. Because this is largely the same model. You know, these people make bad choices with food and with lifestyle, and now they're diabetic. But we would never deny them treatment. Mm -hmm. and we would never look down upon them. And an addict may have chosen to do the drugs initially, but at a certain point, they developed a chronic progressive illness, and yet 43% of medical professionals see them as a, this as a moral issue and not a health issue. And that's a fundamental problem. And again, I think what Dwayne was saying too is that like, if you've had lived experience with it, either directly or with people that you care about, and you've been on the other side, and it's really, it's really tough to care about people who are struggling. And so we all kind of bring that into, into our work, right? And so it is, it's, it, it's helpful. And maybe one thing that you'll get out of today is to just sort of like take stock about like where, how that lands with you. Because that, that impacts how we interact with other people. Um, so this is just a little bit of the research, um, kind of with what Chris was getting at, is that what we know is that addiction is in fact, so we're talking about like chronic misuse of substances, is a chronic brain disease, right? So that while the initial decision to take drugs um, or alcohol is voluntary, continued use impacts your ability to exert self-control, right? So it impacts, um, and that, that lack of self-control is kind of the hallmark of addiction, right? That's that sort of like, why won't they just stop, you know? Hmm. Um, and what we also know is that it changes your brain, right? Repeated substance use changes your brain, and in particular, it impacts the areas of your brain that are critical for judgment, decision making, learning and memory, and behavior, behavior control. So that's sort of like the ability to say, is this a good idea? Should I do this again? Or the ability to, to learn from your experiences, right? So like, oh, this seems like a great idea, and then other things happen down the road, and the ability to connect sort of the initial like urge to use with the, the consequences that happen. You know, a lot of people, you sort of think, how could they keep doing this, right? When it's so clearly negatively impacting your life. And so what we know is that the part of your brain that integrates those and that allows you to learn from your experiences gets impaired with continued substance use. And so it's not just an issue of like being in denial, right? It's not just that someone doesn't want to face the facts, it's that a part of their brain is impacted and they're not able to kind of reckon with that in the same way. There's a lot of research being done now, finally, on, especially around drugs, around whether, what the genetic component may be, you know, where some people, you know, or whether it's, if you run enough cocaine or methamphetamines or opiates through your system, will it permanently re rewire every single person? Or is there a genetic predisposition to once those drugs are entered in, in certain levels over a period of time that it flips a genetic switch and now, you know, the, 
pickle will never be a cucumber again. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but we don't know yet. But once again, there is finally research being done, and, and eventually we will, I think. So. And we're going to talk a little bit more about kind of like the intersecting factors that set someone up to be vulnerable for the chronic disease of substance use. Um, and so it's what's tough about it, and the reason why we can't just say, oh, you, yep, like that's going to be bad for you, you, maybe not, is that there's just there's a lot of different things at play. Um, and so, oh yeah, this is your slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love this. This is MRI brain scans that are done on people in active addiction and people in recovery, right? So. Um, starting on the, that would be my left. <laughs> I used to drink a lot, so. Uh, <laughs> so that, this is the brain scan of the, of the midbrain, especially of a healthy person who's not doing any drugs at all. This is a meth user who's using, there's no higher brain function going on there, there's barely any circulation. But 14 months into abstinence, it's all coming back. You know, so, so the brain does recover with abstinence. Uh, it's really interesting. I've seen brain scans of people who are in active addiction, and their prefrontal cortex will show almost no activity at all. And around 45 days, suddenly blood flow returns. And, and 45 days into abstinence, suddenly the ideas that, that they're being taught about how to live a, a new life begin to make sense. You know, and higher decision making becomes more possible. But it takes. 40 to 45 days just for blood flow to return. So that's... Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why even if not everyone needs complete abstinence for their whole life, many people that's like the necessary life-saving thing that they do, but regardless, um, if you're struggling with drugs and alcohol because of the impacts it has on your brain, at least a period of abstinence, if you can't begin to integrate new things and like kind of reconnect those parts of your brain without that. So that's where, you know, residential treatment sometimes comes in. Um, so again, there's just a fairly large body of research that, that shows that addiction is a chronic medical brain disease and that it's significantly impacted by genetic vulnerabilities, right? So that not unlike other <coughs> chronic diseases, there's a lot of different components that go into it. So um, kind of what we were talking about, this sort of idea that why, so why do some people struggle more than others, right? Um, and what we know is that not unlike other chronic diseases that, you know, so family, family history, right, so the genetic component, but also um, quantity and frequency and what drug you're using, and then also what happens to you in your life, what happens to you in your early experiences, and then what happens to you throughout your life. All of those things kind of mix together to increase vulnerability and risk factors for having a problematic relationship with substances. Um, so probably one of the best examples of that is the adverse childhood experience. Um, how many of you have heard of the, of the ACE study? Okay. Yeah. So the ACE study was um, done, I think, in the 90s. It was a partnership between the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, like the insurance company, and they were looking at um, they were looking at why um, chronic. I think they originally started with someone who was a doctor was working with his patient who had had this great um, lost a bunch of weight, was having this great health response, and then she kind of had backslid and had a significant relapse in her health. And he was trying to figure out like what was going on and what other factors were connected to it. And so they pooled like 25,000 patients and they, they came up with this list of adverse experiences. Right? And they, they, so they pooled everyone to see, or they you know, screened everyone to see how many of them had had these experiences. And what they found is that adverse experiences in childhood significantly increase your risk for developing chronic disease later in life, right? So. This is a lot of text, um, but you guys are going to get the, the PowerPoint later. But the sort of summary is that, you know, experiences of, of physical, sexual, verbal abuse, of neglect, of, um, you know, conflict in the home, or even separation and divorce, um, of witnessing abuse, um, of, of having parents or caregivers who struggle with substance use or who struggle with mental health challenges, um, and even, you know, of um, being separated from a parent because of incarceration and the other stressors that go with that, that those adverse experiences, the more you have of those, the more kind of um, correlates with health, with the um, negative health outcomes later in life, right? And so, for example, folks who had an ACE score of four, so of that list that I kind of summarized, four of those things, seven times more likely to struggle with alcoholism. People who had experienced six or more of those were 
4,600% more likely to struggle with IV drug use, right? And it also correlates with like, perhaps like the 10 leading causes of, of death, that like when these things happen earlier in your life, um, there's some increased risks. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind about the ACE is that this was done on like mostly like white middle class people who had insurance, right? So these are people who had a lot of other protect protective factors in place and these experiences still um, made them more vulnerable to chronic diseases, including addiction. And so not even like taking into account um, you know, impacts of racism and oppression and how those impact us on a daily basis. And, and also, if you have these factors, but you live in a culture where nobody's drinking or doing drugs, the risk level goes down some. But if you're, if you're having these risk factors and you live in a place where there are people you know who are doing drugs, or they're, you know, where you're in a culture where that's you know, just one part of it, then the likelihood goes way up just because availability is, is more. You know, there's, it's easier to get access to, you've seen it, you understand it, it's, a, it's one of the possible go-tos in terms of finding relief from what's going on with you. And so that exacerbates things even further. Right, it's kind of like the ticket, there's no one thing that determines um, whether or not you'll struggle with substance use, right? But we, what I like about highlighting this is that it, it sort of dispels a myth again that it's a moral failing, right? Because these are things that no one had control over, right? When, when this stuff happens to you when you're little, that's not that's not something that you that you chose or that you that you deserved, right? So these so even things that happen to you early on when you have no control can impact struggles that you have later on. And so I just like to tell the larger story because again I think it it changes how we how we see it. Um, and again, it's, it's important to kind of broaden our, our framework for understanding substance use because it impacts, you know, if people seek treatment, what happens to them when they get to treatment, right? Like how they're treated, depending on if we're seeing it as like something that's predominantly their fault or we understand the larger context. Um, and it, it also impacts what treatment is offered, right? If we have a better understanding of the factors that go into it. Um, and it impacts, you know, how treatment is improved, right? So if we see this as a moral failing, then it's not really a public health concern and we don't really need to do research to make sure we're doing good treatment, right? Versus um, if we understand that there's a lot of different factors that connect to it, um, there's more motivation societally to continue to research it. <coughs> and also for, for the people that are struggling with it to understand that in part some of your struggles is because of you know, a part of your brain that's not working that's a lot more motivating to see treatment, right, than if you kind of you're already carrying the shame of, of what you're struggling with, but to have someone explain that there's more than that and that maybe there's also hope, right, that there that this is something part of your brain that's not working and that that could be changed, it increases people's willingness to even give it a try, right? So, in, the, in the grand scheme of, of how this all fits into your brain and, and the neuroscience of your brain, when you think about the whole brain in general, you have the frontal cortex at the very front that makes all these decisions and judgments. All these things are actually located in your limbic system, which is right there in the center, including stuff that relates to the A, a scale. You know, all your your um, emotional memories are in your limbic system, so is your pleasure center. And so these connections that you make early on that are connected to your brain that you don't like, when you take those drugs and alcohol, they kind of numb this negative feeling and you make stronger connections. Oh yeah, I like this alcohol, I like these drugs, it helps numb this emotional pain that I'm feeling and we continue to do this and continue to do this and these, these connections get stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger to the point where something you don't need becomes something you physiologically need in order to, to function on a daily basis. Yeah, it's kind of how the it's like being hungry for food, but way strong. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Right. We're With, sidetracked. Well, and, and very much so. Like, you know, the hedonic response system in the brain is there. Like, my understanding is we developed a pleasure response to reinforce behavior that's good for the survival of myself and the species. And uh, so when I eat food or when I have sex, I get this dump of dopamine that says, do that again. That's good. You know? But when I put cocaine or meth or opiates into my brain, I get 10,000 times as much dopamine in the same receptors. And uh, now, my, now my brain begins to read the drugs as necessary for survival and things like food and sex, not so much. You know, and, uh, and it completely hijacks. It creates a new neural pathway between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system that does not exist in people who don't use. And, uh, and, and it's like, yeah, it's like oxygen. 
you know, and, and it's very much, it is that twofold thing, you know, one of my favorite sayings is that nature loaded the gun and nurture pulled the trigger, you know, <laughs> I may have genetic predispositions, but if things don't happen to me and the culture I'm in don't reinforce it, I may not end up, you know, with, a, with an addiction problem, but, you know, both pieces are, are typically present. So, um, and that's actually not that different from other chronic health concerns, right? And so I like this slide because it sort of shows relapse rates. I know the text is a little small, but so on the left here, this is substance use disorders, this is hypertension, and that's asthma. And so there are relapse rates for people with chronic illness. And what you see is that hypertension and asthma have a like, similarly, if not even slightly higher relapse rate. So the takeaway from that is that anytime you're asking someone to engage in behavior change, right, to do something different in their life on a day-to-day -day basis, right, don't eat this, do eat that, do this differently, take your medication, changing your habits, it's hard. And even if that's a medical, if you're doing that for a chronic health reason, it's just as hard. And so we can use that to kind of look at people who are struggling with substances a little bit differently, right, that just like with hypertension and asthma, um, if someone relapses when they're struggling with a substance use, it's not because, you know, they're low life and they don't deserve help, right? It's more like it's difficult, behavior change is difficult, and anytime someone kind of gets off their treatment program, they might struggle, right? And so relapse is sort of an indication that you need to reconnect with your supports. Maybe you need to adjust your treatment plan, right? Not unlike if you were struggling with like implementing other behavior change for health conditions. It's very much seeing this as a chronic health issue, not as a moral failing, you know, this is a health issue. And recovery rates amongst people in substance use disorder are remarkably similar to those with, you know, who are diabetic or asthma or hypertension. Like, and I know you guys have seen a lot of this, like 15% of the people who you diagnose with a chronic condition will flail around for six or seven months and find a way to manage it and follow their treatment plan, and they'll be fine. You know, addiction is just like the rest of these chronic uh, illnesses where Largely, they could be put entirely into remission with some behavioral changes. What about finding ways to, to not be around the triggers that set you off to use? That's part of it. That's part of the behavior change, though, right? It's like go, go somewhere different, be around different people. Yeah. By the time people are in severe substance use disorder, whether they're an addict or not is irrelevant. They need separation from lifestyle, and that's what like, inpatient treatment does. By the time it's that severe, we need to pull you up out of the world you've been in for a month at least, and then move you not back to your house when you're done, but into a sober living, into a longer term supportive environment, so that you have the opportunity to build new, new habits. Because I can't send you right back to where you just came from, even if I put you in treatment for 30 days, because the, you, the ruts are too deep in that life, and you'll end up falling right back into it. And this is the same, but it's the same struggle with, with people with asthma, you know, 15% will, will figure it out in the first year, 15% will never figure it out and it will eventually kill them before their time, and, and the 70% the in the middle will flail around and over the course of a decade will eventually find a way to manage it on some level. But the numbers are the same whether you're an addict or a diabetic or, or have asthma, the numbers are the same. And so we have to treat it like it's no different than the other chronic illnesses. You know, the relapses can be more catastrophic and more dangerous and more costly to society, but still, it's not different. Yeah. So, so, from, so that we just kind of wanted to get general framework to spell some of the myths, um, and now we're going to talk quickly about sort of what the research says about what we do about that, right? So, okay, so you're struggling with substances. What is the best way to respond to that? So... The first, one of the most impactful things that um, we can do on a public health level and especially in healthcare settings is this idea of universal screening. So a lot of, well, um, y'all are familiar with many screenings, I'm sure. Um, so you know all about them, but you know, a lot of healthcare facilities screen for a variety of things and not just like medications and allergies and whether or not you smoke, but even mental health symptoms, right? I know y'all are really good at screening for that. So, but what about substance use, right? A lot of times it's not a default to ask, um, to universally screen patients for substance use. And so, what we know is that, so, how many of you have heard of SBIRT? Great, you. Uh -huh. A few fans, good, right? Um, so SBIRT is, um, it's an evidence-based practice and it's basically the idea of using universal screenings to, for early detection and to reduce the impacts of substance use kind of across um, the lifespan. Um, and um, 
Yes. <laughs> Um, and so it's a really good way to hide. So we, we screen for other health risk behaviors. So screening for substance use is, is really no different. And so um, what it stands for is screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment. So basically screening is using some kind of standardized questionnaire, right? The brief intervention is, is just a short conversation, right? Again, this is not your, your sole responsibility to forever change someone's decision about using substances, right? That's not where you can be most impactful. But, it's, but there is a place to make use of that um, conversation, right? If you get information from the screener that maybe someone is struggling, there's something really cool that can happen there. And then the last part is referral to treatment, right? So you don't have to do all of it, you just like figure out if something's happening and then you actually have someone somewhere to send them to get more help, right? And so that's, that's the model and that's extremely effective. So what we know is that, you know, while addiction affects more people than heart disease, diabetes, and cancer, only about one in 10 people with addiction get any kind of treatment, right? So there's there's the people that you may that you may know are struggling, but without the universal screenings, you're probably missing people. Um, and that using screenings in a healthcare setting is one of the most effective ways um, to create this change. Um, and the reason that is is because, and that, this is like my favorite piece of research, but that when people are in a healthcare setting, they are more um, receptive to healthcare messages, right? Because they're already here to see their doctor, so they're already kind of predispositioned to receive information about their health. And so if you treat substance use just as another component of their health, then they're, they're more likely, to, there's sort of like a window of opportunity to kind of like hear some more information or have a conversation about, about their use. And so this is like one of the takeaways that we wanted to highlight for y'all, that again, it's like a unique window of opportunity that you can capitalize on. It doesn't mean, and so there's ways to like take advantage of that, and then there's ways to like shut that window down, right? So it doesn't mean that because you have this window of receptivity, that if you just like shake your finger at them enough, that that then that they'll stop, right? Like that's not the window of opportunity. The window of opportunity is to like plant a seed and start to have a conversation and start to shift the way they're thinking, and you're kind of like opening the door to this the long arc of, of, of recovery, right? Because the reality is, is that even in Austin recovery, when we see people in outpatient treatment or we see them in residential treatment, that's like a chunk in a long arc of what it will take for them to, to recover from substances. So we, we are all seeing people sort of in a link in the chain, but it, what it takes to, to recover goes way beyond that, if that makes sense. So no one person um, is able to completely solve this thing for people. And I think that that's important to remember because it can be really overwhelming when you care about someone and they're sitting there, whether it's a loved one or a patient, and you're like, oh my gosh, like, are they gonna die? Like, they need a lot of help, right? And I think taking, feeling responsible for all the levels of them getting better can, can feel overwhelming and like you don't know how to do that. But if you just recognize like where you are in the chain of them getting better and you can, and how to capitalize on that, then you can be really effective. Does that make sense? Okay. So, and of course, universal screening is endorsed by all the major medical associations as being important. And so again, we know that y'all are not, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what this means for people as we know you're not doing universal screening yet. We're, we're just saying it's a good thing to do. Yeah, <laughs> sort of like a preview, little teaser. And also another thing that's really cool is that I also know that a lot of you, your patients are already talking to you about their substance use because I have patients, right? So that's another thing that's cool is that like, Y'all are making referrals to Austin Recovery, which means that something is happening where your patients feel comfortable telling